during the year, it's even difficult to tell where the glacier ends and the terminus begins. Sorry, the, the glacier ends and the fjord begins. Um, and then just to give you a sense of scale, here's another shot of the terminus with a helicopter um, right there. So this is a 100 meter high cliff. Um, these are really enormous icebergs, and, and we're thinking of these icebergs as basically large granular class that are behaving like a granular material. Um, so there's been a number of studies now that have shown that changes in, in ice melange rigidity seem to have an impact on, on glacier dynamics, and in particular on iceberg calving. And so as, as an example, I've put together a series of MODIS images from, again, from Jakobsov. And it's a little bit difficult to tell in these images exactly where the, the glacier terminus is, so I've marked that with a, a black curve here. And as you step through the images from February um, going into March, you see that the sea ice and ice melange in the fjord starts to break up a little bit um, and then refreezes. And, and during that two month period, the glacier terminus hasn't changed at all. It's, I mean, it's probably advanced a little bit down fjord, but there haven't been any calving events. And then as you continue later into the spring, um, again, we start to see the sea ice breaking up in the fjord. Um, it's retreating farther up fjord. And then between April 10th and April 25th, we have our first large calving event of the year with, that resulted in a couple of kilometers of retreat. And so we, we see this pattern of, of sea ice growth and, and increase in ice melange rigidity during the winter time that's associated with a, a drop off in calving activity. And this is something that we see basically year after year at a number of glaciers around Greenland. And so if ice melange affects calving, um, then it is important for glacier and ice sheet stability due to nonlinear um, effects associated with, with calving and, and how that affects ice sheet drawdown. Um, and then we have a number of observations that indicate that ice melange behaves sort of like an ice shelf, which provides resistance to, to flow, re resistance to flow from the upstream part of the ice sheet or glacier. Uh, and but then there are other time periods where the, the ice melange behaves a bit differently, where it flows very quickly. And so here's a, as an example, here's a time lapse sequence from 2008. Hopefully this works okay through the internet. Um, so it's one photo per day. And we see that a lot of time the icebergs are just sort of slowly creeping down the fjord, and then there are these pulses of motion. And those pulses of motion are associated with calving events. Um, but this is the, the point here is that this is clearly not just icebergs kind of drifting around in a fjord as a result of, of ocean currents. This is behaving like um, some sort of rigid material, at least part of the time. Um, during some of our earlier work at Jakobshavn, we put GPS receivers and surveying prisms on top of the, the glacier terminus and on some icebergs and observed some in really interesting behavior. Uh, these two panels show the, the black curves are the velocity of the glacier terminus, so these are markers that are moving you know, down glacier and they're accelerating a little bit, uh, the black ones. And then the red is the uh, velocity of one of the icebergs that we instrumented. And so we see that during part of the time, that iceberg is basically just getting... Ah, I didn't mean to do that. Um, at least part of the time, that iceberg is, is getting pushed from behind by the glacier terminus. It's moving basically the exact same speed as the glacier. And then there are other time periods where the velocity increases really dramatically, and those are the, the calving events. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting here is that after, following the calving events, the icebergs are actually moving slower than the glacier is, is, is advecting into the fjord. And so there's this sort of accordion-like motion of the ice melange. Um, and then just to show you, this is what one of the calving events looks like. Um, we start with the ice melange being very stable, and then within a matter of minutes, it accelerates to something like a, moving at like a kilometer per hour. And you can see uh, the different shear margins where the, the icebergs are moving past each other or, or moving past the side of the fjord. Um, we followed that study up with uh, a, another study in 2012 where we visited the glacier in fjord with a terrestrial radar. Um, we had it scanning every three minutes, and the idea here was that now we have an instrument that, that can observe ice melange motion in a way that wasn't possible before. 
Um, and so from that data, I won't go into the detail too much into the details, but from that data we've we've observed some behavior that that I think is the first indication that this is really behaving similarly to other types of granular materials. Um, and so this is one plot from a, a 2012, sorry, this is data from 2012, the paper just came out last year. Um, and this is showing velocities along the center line of the fjord at different time periods. And so these are would be like a longitudinal profile. Um, and so what you see is that uh, I guess is blue is, is, the, is when the event starts, and then as you move into purple and red, that's as time is progressing forward. And if we look at this blue curve with the squares on it, um, that's at three minutes after the event, and then there's this front at the beginning. It's a, a jamming front, um, which propagates down fjord. Um, six minutes later, that front is, has moved a few kilometers, and that front is moving much faster than the icebergs are actually moving. And that's something that's consistent with laboratory studies of other um, granular materials. And so this is this is giving us motivation to think about the about ice melange as a granular material. Um, and so this is why we've brought on physicists like Michael and Justin to help us out and help us understand how the, this material behaves and what are the implications of ice melange behavior on glacier dynamics. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Or actually, I think Justin, are you going next? Or yeah, uh, I'll, give, I'll give a brief introduction of the um, of granular physics, and then we'll. Michael can lead in with the experiments, and then I'll talk about the modeling a little bit later. If, if Can everybody hear me okay, I assume? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so Michael and I are physicists, and one of the things we study is granular physics, and so I thought it would be useful to have a few slides just to give people who are not as familiar with some of the uh, fundamental theory behind granular physics uh, a little help. Uh, so granular materials are interesting to us because granular materials such as sand can support stress and remain rigid as evidenced by these sand dunes here. You know, you you walk, they, they have formations and uh, and form dunes and mountain-like structures that are rigid. They don't just fall apart like a like a liquid would. So they, so granular materials can support stress and remain rigid. Um, and then can you advance, Jason? Sorry, here we go. But then sometimes, uh, they can flow very rapidly, as evidenced by this avalanche here. What was once rigid and uh, quiescent, um, you know, a, a few tremors later, and suddenly a, a, a giant river of snow is flowing down the mountain. So um, this this way that granular materials can transition between a rigid and flowing like state is a uh, it's a very subtle transition that uh, that we're interested in. It's called the jamming transition. Um, so there's a few different things that affect. Um, how granular material becomes jammed, right? So this is a um, this is a graph from a review article in 2010 by Andrea Liu and Sid Nagel, and it, it gives you an idea of, of basically uh, how physicists think about uh, granular materials and how they become jammed. So there are there are um, three important uh, parameters that determine whether or not a granular material is jammed. Uh, one of them is temperature, which we're not going to be talking about as much here. That basically is the kinetic energy of the particles. Um, and so most of the stuff we're talking about, they're not really moving around that much. So we're going to we're gonna ignore temperature. But generally, like for a glass, like a molecular glass, if you cool it down, um, it will become rigid um, and, and, and jam, essentially. Um, uh, can you hit the advance once more? So ice melange lives here. So what's important for an ice melange is stress, how much force is applied to it, and density. So if you um, if you increase the density, then your your material will moved into a jam state. Um, if I compact something more, then it becomes more rigid. Like if I if I uh, if I take my coffee grinds right and I compact them more when I'm uh, making espresso or something like that, then the then the coffee gets then the granular material gets very rigid. Um, um, also, if I take something that is rigid, say like a sand dune, and I push on it hard enough, eventually you can push your hand through the sand, so applying stress can take you out of a jammed state. So for low stress and high density, materials are, um, are jammed. Um, and then if you apply stress, you can unjam it. If you push hard enough, you can make it flow just like a glacier terminus pushes hard enough on the melange that it can flow, or if you change the density of the melange, um, 
then uh, it can also um, uh, flow as well if you make it less dense. If there's any questions at any point in time, please just uh, please just chime in and uh, and and feel free to ask questions. Uh, so uh, one really interesting thing that that uh, that is uh, about granular materials is how our force is transmitted through granular materials. You know, um, for a fluid, uh, uh, you know, if I push on, you know, just like your how your brakes work in, or any hydraulic system works, you push on one side of the fluid, and that force is transmitted equally throughout the fluid. Um, and pushes um, with the uh, same pressure on all sides of the container that contains the fluid. For a grain of the material, that is a, uh, that's a little bit more complicated. Force is transmitted mostly by these things we call force chains. Um, and so here you see an experiment where you have a bunch of hard um, granular particles. They're actually what's called photoelastic disks. They're plastic disks that, that um, you can visualize the amount of stress on them by using cross polarizers. And so this is an imaging technique that uh, tells you how much stress or how, how hard these granular materials are being pushed on. Um, the lighter colors are high stress and the more no color or more transparent is no stress at all. So um, what this is, this is a, this is a channeled, um, this is what's called a hopper. It's basically granular material flowing through a narrow channel and it's stuck. At the bottom, you can see that arch at the very bottom, you can see that arch of yellow, and what that is is that is a force chain. That's an arch that's supporting all the weight of the grain and the material above it, and you can see how all the force chains are um, moved like lightning bolts throughout the material, and, and they all terminate on the walls of the container. So these force chains span the entire size of the system and terminate on the walls of the container, um, and they support all the stress in the material is basically supported by these force chains. So some particles don't really matter so much to the force in the material, and some particles are crucial. They're, they're like keystones. The really bright yellow particles are like keystones for transmitting the force. Um, uh, so one interesting consequence of this force chain is that uh, shear stress can support weight. So for example, in grain silos, the pressure doesn't increase linearly with depth as it does in the ocean. So, um, you know, we all know that, you know, as you go deeper and deeper in the ocean, the pressure just increases linearly with depth, but that's not true in a granular material. Um, a lot of the weight of the material ends up being supported by friction between the uh, walls of the container and the grains. So the actual pressure distribution inside of a grain silo depends a lot upon the frictional properties between the grains and the walls themselves. Um, so as a consequence, the pressure inside or the average stress inside of a, a granular material often levels out as you go a few uh, container diameters deep into the material. So the pressure is more or less constant um, deep into the silo and most of the force is being supported by friction with the walls. Uh, so key, some key questions that we try to understand um, while thinking about the jamming transition or just to remind you how a solid material be, can, can go from a rigid state to a, how a granular material can go from a rigid state to a flowing state. Um, so one of the key questions is the, what, at what density does this happen? So um, what is the critical density at which um, a system first starts to develop these force chains? This is called the critical density or the jamming density, if you will. Above the jamming density, the system requires a critical force to flow. Once it's jammed, I have to push hard enough in order to make it move. Um, uh, under constant velocity conditions, jamming produces stick-slip flow, right? So if I push a granular material um, at a constant velocity, sometimes it can get stuck and the force and the stress in the material will build up to very large values until finally you've reached that critical force and then the system will start to flow again and the stress gets released. So um, just like pushing a, um, like, like a, like pushing a block of wood across a piece of sandpaper, sometimes it'll get stuck and you have to push harder to make it move. Um, and sometimes it'll flow a little bit easier. So you, it experiences a stick, stick slip type of flow and suddenly it'll unjam. And this is something that uh, Michael's gonna talk about um, that he sees in his experiments. Um, and then, so one of the last questions is, um, you know, so what happens when a system is open? In a fjord, we have the terminus on one side of the system, and then this two, quasi two-dimensional granular material, and then on the other side of the fjord, it's basically open to the ocean. 
So how does a fjord become, how does the ice melange become jammed uh, when one side um, is completely open? Um, and that's where the walls of the fjord and the geometry of the fjord are, become, are going to become uh, really important. Um, so with that, I will kind of uh, um, turn the microphone over to Michael, and he can tell you some more about the experiments. Okay, so one of the interesting things from the granular physics point of view, and I should check, right, I can be heard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, is, is what we were leading to at the last slide, which is this idea of open flows. And to just give a little bit of perspective, you know, a lot of the, the sand dunes and the um, avalanche that Justin showed are examples of open flow. There's no container confining things, but that jamming diagram that's classic in granular materials and in the field has actually mostly been studied in what we call closed flows or closed systems because you want the density to be well controlled. So you can find the system um, in all directions, so density is well defined. Maybe you put it between two concentric cylinders in a coet flow. Maybe you put it in a parallel shear cell. Um, and you then apply either constant velocity or constant force to the system and study the, the jamming properties. And that allows you to explore things like the critical density because it's a well-defined quantity for the entire system. When you move to open flows, uh, it, it, there's an interesting question, I think, in the jamming diagram is, are there other parameters that perhaps become as important or more important than just density and stress. Now, one geometry we, we mentioned here on this slide that's been studied a fair amount is what we call the classic hopper geometry. And that was in the image um, from the Behringer group that Justin showed. And here, the simplest shape is you have slope slides and you have sides to the system. So you start with a wide opening at the top that's narrow at the bottom. And clearly, there's a chance with that constriction for some sort of jamming to occur as the material has to work its way out the smaller hole. Uh, it's a little more challenging to think what happens if you have um, perfectly parallel walls with an opening end. Um, now, from the totally uh, naive um, picture and the most simplest physics picture, the fjord is just the two straight lines. So of course, the sides aren't perfectly smooth, um, and it does have some shape and geometry to it. but it was an interesting starting question for us is even in a smooth, perfectly straight channel where you might expect everything to just be pushed out the end and never get jammed, there's no place for density to increase or variations to occur. We discovered particle shape can produce torques that produce jamming, and we'll show that with some of the data. And it really raised these interesting questions of these competing effects of the shape and the geometry of the actual channel you're flowing through, and the shape and geometry of the particles and the physics that's produced by that. Um, these are competing effects. They both add to the jamming in some way. How do they work together? Um, can you truly just separate them? And that's one place where we felt lab experiments and modeling could be very powerful. So then, yeah, the next slide. So here's our system to give you an idea of the scale the channel width and the initial system. This is actually our, where we got our preliminary results. We are in the process of constructing a much larger system in the lab um, and to do a better job um, of getting the scales closer to what is happening in the fjord. This is very, very close to that, um, but if you look at the scaling, things like our slowest barrier speed is probably still a little bit faster if you scale it than a glacier would be. But the channel width is 10 and a half centimeters. We use particles of a single size. If you recall uh, Jason's images of the actual fjord, the other thing we want to do is really vary the particle size distribution. That's another important parameter. Um, we push the barrier, which is on the right in both images. There's the schematic side view and then the actual photograph of the apparatus. Um, and we move that anywhere from 10 to the minus 3 millimeters per second to 10 millimeters per second. So we have a wide range of pushing speeds we can look at though the slower ones are the ones we're interested in for the glacier point of view. And then this particular apparatus, is a little hard to see in the picture, um, being a first-generation apparatus, simply measured forces 
on the pushing wall, which is basically the glacier, by using the displacement of two springs that are placed between the two plastic barriers you can see. Um, the new version of the apparatus actually uses um, more, more, more detailed force sensors and more of them across the barrier. But it did give us a resolution of um, 10 to the minus 3, 3 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons with forces ranging from 0 to 2 newtons that we were measuring. So you'll see we measured a wide range of forces. So if you go to the next slide, um, you might as well just click through and get all the images up. Okay. Yeah. Since we're not really – so we do have some movies we can show at the end after the talk that didn't really work within the PowerPoint. But what I wanted to highlight here is how we ultimately got at the fact that there was this torque from the wall. So you're looking at r roughly six different combinations of either disks or rectangular particles. Why did we do that? Well, the first thing is if you go to the bottom right where you have the monodispersed disk, those, when we push on them, just flow through the system. They never jam, nothing interesting happens, and we'll show that in the force diagrams. If you go to the top left, that's just a single layer of rectangular blocks at the wall. And if you push on those, they don't actually jam, but you'll see points where they actually buckle, and that's indicated by the blue arrow. They'll actually move in from the wall, and it's this buckling which seems to be generated by torques at the wall. We're looking at other shapes like ellipses, and you get similar behavior. We're a little worried at first that it was just the corners of the rectangular blocks, but it does seem to be the shape. They buckle. That puts motion perpendicular to the walls that allows for local compression of the material on the inside. So now you can go and put different combinations. If you have rectangular blocks throughout the system, that's where we first notice jamming, and we'll show some force curves for that, and you can see the disc getting all stuck, the force building up, and then the system unjamming. The interesting two ones, if you put blocks on the wall and discs in the center, remember all discs through the system don't jam. The monodispersed discs don't jam. If you put just a single layer of blocks, you actually can see jamming as those blocks um, have their buckling events and push into the system. The perfectly symmetrical discs at the wall do not ever buckle. So if I put discs on the wall with blocks in the middle, I don't observe any jamming. The whole thing slides down. Now, the other feature of granular materials is inside the material, as it flows, you generally get random motions and rearrangements. It's usually rearrangements that lead to the flow. So there are two types of flow you can see in the system. When I look at the monodispersed discs, for the most part, you get uniform plug flow. All the discs just move down the system together without any jamming and without any real variations. If I put discs of two different size, so the middle image on the bottom, they're by disperse, you get a different flow pattern as the discs rearrange around each other. But because there's no buckling from the walls in this case, we also don't really observe any jamming. And so we have an opportunity to start exploring that more as you look at greater variety in the sizes and maybe some variation in the shapes. And so this really is a nice starting point. We've learned already something new from a granular physics point of view, whether it's relevant directly to the glacier and the fjord, we still need to see, but this buckling idea to cause jamming is a completely new idea from the wall. Um, so Jason, why don't we go forward and just look at some of, um, that would have been a video, it's not working right now, so we can skip it. Same thing here, and then same thing here, and then we'll go to the force curves. So the big measure, the two main measurements we have in these experiments are tracking the particle motions, because that'll help us compare to the fjord um, behavior. Um, Jason showed you some of the data with velocity for the chunks of ice in the fjord, and as I mentioned, we can get very different flow behavior depending on the particle distributions and shapes even if there's no jamming. So figuring out the right structure to model the fjord is an important first step in these studies. Once you do get jamming in, the, in these open flows, this is the open flow constant velocity situation. The, 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 the iceberg terminus is moving at some 
a roughly steady constant rate until there's a calving event. Um, and we can do that with our the, the pushing wall pushing the system. So we move at constant velocity. So when the system jams, as um, Justin talked about, you get stick slip behavior. The first thing that happens is the forces increase on the wall as it is still moving at its constant velocity until the force gets high enough. If you remember that jamming diagram, at a fixed density, once you're jammed, it requires some minimum force before you move again. So when you hit that force, the system starts moving again. The um, jam part, because it's an open flow, easily breaks up, and then the force drops. So you can see in this curve, we just indicated one of the jamming events, and this is a comparison of the different wall geometries. So the black curve is just rectangular bars everywhere, and you see the most amount of evidence of jamming. There's multiple peaks in the force versus strain curve. So the strain is just, in this case, the distance that the pushing wall has moved through the system, normalized by the system size. So we see multiple events, and you see the largest jamming events um, in order of magnitude higher than some of the other systems. Um, the rectangular bars with the disc on the inside is the red curve, and you, as I said, you get jamming, it's not as big. And then when we did just the boundary of the rectangular bars, there's no increase in the force, but you do actually see, as I mentioned, the um, bars moving off the wall, having that, that um, bending experience. And discs on the boundary with bars inside is that green curve, and again, the force is rather flat. So we go to the next slide. We did look at how much this depends on the speed. Doesn't matter how fast you're going. And as you can see, the black curve is the slowest speed. Green curve is the fastest speed. Um, there does seem to be an impact on how big the forces get based on the speed. This is all with rectangular particles in the middle. But in all cases, we see jamming. In all cases, we see the increases in forces. And as Justin will talk about in the modeling, ultimately one of the questions is, does the jamming generate large enough forces that it can impact the calving events? Um, and so if we go to the next slide. It was, I did want to kind of just show one expanded view. Um, this was um, the rectangular bars going incredibly slowly. This is the slowest speed we could reach, just to kind of show the scale and resolution of the current um, force measurement and the comparison to what a glacier speed might be if you scale our system. So we got down to 10 to the minus 3 millimeters per second um, at a glacier speed of 40 meters per day. If you scale our system to the actual four dimensions, we would have liked to get down to 10 to the minus 4, which is what the new system will do. We still saw jamming um, within a good resolution. It's obviously much smaller than when you go fast, and so that's something we'll have to look at. Um, I think that's all with the experiment. And now back to Justin for modeling. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, the modeling efforts are kind of driven both by things I see. Uh, what I've kind of tried to do is, you know, think about both uh, actual fjord and by the simple uh, trends that Michael is seeing in the experimental data. And so I'll kind of touch on both of those. But the main idea is kind of shown here. So uh, on the upper left, I have a uh, picture of an ice melange similar to the one Jason showed on the very uh, one of the very first slides. And, um, you know, we can extract velocity flow fields from the ice melange as shown by uh, some of the particle image velocimetry data that um, is shown in the upper right. And uh, th these are some of the things we're going to be trying to measure in, uh, during our simulation. So I'm, I'm thinking about an ice melange, at least at this initial stage, as a granular and fluid mechanics problem, right? So we have um, – <clears throat> Uh, right now, I just have disks, as you can see in, in the bottom there, disks of different size, or they're two-dimensional. Um, I will discuss three-dimensional effects as well. Um, and But for right now, they're just disks, and uh, something we're going to try to move towards in the future is getting them to be not disks, you know, something that's elongated, maybe not rectangular like what Michael has, but certainly something that's not just a pure circle. Um, but there's going to be uh, both granular physics going on here and fluid mechanics because these, you know, disks are sitting in a, uh, 
well, in the ocean, right? So um, uh, I think what the conclusion we've come to so far is that the granular forces are kind of the most important part because the ice melange is moving so slowly. But it has aspects of both that we're going to have to worry about. Um, so here's some major questions and goals for the modeling effort. Uh, so, you know, can we develop a simple way of thinking about the rheology of ice melange based on a few physical principles? You know, we hope, we hope that the things that we learn about uh, Jakob Schaben or other fjords that we study are uh, at least applicable to, you know, ice melanges that you may see in other situations or in other fjords in, um, in, in Antarctica, for example. Um, so we hope that we can develop a few simple, simple ideas that people can take away from. Um, so if we can consider ice melange a quasi 2D granular material, what is the role of particle shape, friction, polydispersity of granules, uh, et cetera? Um, obviously, we know that these are important from the preliminary experiments. Um, and so one of the things we're really going to try to attack is to vary all these things in a quantitative way and see what, what really matters and, uh, and what doesn't. And um, I'm going to add on to that second point real quick, um, you know, three-dimensional effects. Uh, you know, under a certain amount of – if the force is strong enough, clearly icebergs will probably uh, raft on top of each other or buckle down into the water, and that will create kind of a, a limit of the amount of stress the ice melange can support. Um, we can estimate that stress, but um, that's something to think about, too. Um, another thing that's really important is going to be fjord geometry. You know, even a slight narrowing in a certain region can cause uh, jamming, just like in the hopper flow that we showed where there was an arch of granular particles that kind of supported the whole weight of the material. So, um, so changing the fjord geometry, you know, having it narrow in certain regions and maybe get become more open in others will be something that, we, that we'd like to do as well. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one nice thing about simulations, obviously, is that you know everything. Um, we can look at all the force chains um, in our material and see how the force is exactly transmitted from the, the from the terminus to the fjord walls, and, uh, and and look at the dynamics of those force chains. And uh, perhaps the most importantly, can these stresses um, in, uh, that develop in the ice melange influence calving behavior, as Jason pointed out in the beginning, and also um, and also a fjord circulation, right? Uh, so um, obviously the ice melange on the on the surface is going to affect heat transfer to the to the uh, the waters in the fjord, which may have an impact on on circulation. So um, uh, that that's more of a uh, kind of a an interesting question. I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do address address it, but it's something that I certainly think about. So maybe we can um, – uh, okay, yeah, so where to start? Basic assumptions. So uh, what I'm assuming is that ice melange is, for the most part, two-dimensional. This is a pretty good starting point um, for, our, uh, for our simulations. Uh, the motion is generally slow in ice melange, except maybe during a calving event. So I'm going to assume that we only have hydrostatic buoyancy forces on the, on the iceberg so that they're, they're, they're confined to, in 2D, and then simple drag forces from the water. So – um, if you give an iceberg a kick, obviously it's not going to move forever. It experiences a drag force from the ocean around it, and it will slow down and come to a stop rather quickly. Um, so the, we're going to include just simple drag forces that that um, that you know keep the system uh, that that di that dissipate energy out, out of the system. Um, in my model, individual icebergs are represented by circular disks for right now of different sizes, which experience both contact and frictional forces. Um, and I'll go into detail in, in, into that. Um, and there's a long list of additional effects which we can consider later, such as particle shape, fjord geometry, 3D buckling, and seasonal sea ice, among others, um, which, we all, which we want to consider. So here's a cartoon, I guess, of the model as it stands. Um, I have my... Uh, melange filled with thousands or tens of thousands of particles of different size. I can control the size distribution of the particles. Um, they start in an unjammed state. These, this is not jammed. The particles are just all kind of uh, distributed. They don't overlap each other, but they're not um, – the system isn't jammed. There's voids in different areas. Um, and then we start moving the terminus at some velocity, and um, the particles experience 
contact force, friction between each other, and friction with the fjord walls. Um, and then we could look at the resulting force on the terminus and the rotation of the particles and basically anything we want. When two quote unquote icebergs interact, they have a pairwise interaction. Um, there's two types of forces. One is a normal viscoelastic repulsive force. So if they overlap, that's, that's indicated by the red arrows in the diagram. If they overlap, then they push each other apart. And um, if there's a high velocity impact, that dissipates a lot of energy because it's a viscoelastic response. Okay? Uh, uh, the other force is a tangential kinetic frictional force, uh, meaning if the two icebergs are sliding past one another or rotating uh, with respect to each other, then they dissipate energy due to sliding friction. Um, as of now, we do not have static friction in our model because that is a much more difficult um, thing to simulate, but we're working on that. But, uh, but there's a kinetic frictional force. And um, also, as I, oh, we want to go back real quick. There's also experience with simple drag force, as I said, so they'll eventually come to rest when set in motion. So they experience a force due to being in, in the water. So here's a, a so here are the basic simulations. Jason's going to go ahead and play it. We're going to push the icebergs from the left. They start to jam. And the colors that you see, red is rotating icebergs in one clockwise, and blue is rotating icebergs in counterclockwise. And what you're supposed to see here as we push this plug of icebergs is that most of the rotational motion, icebergs rotating, happens at the edges. That's because their experience is friction with the wall, which forces them to rotate in place. And icebergs in the center of the melange kind of get stuck, and they don't rotate. They move along with the plug, but they don't really rotate at all. And so that kind of leads back to Michael's point. If instead we had we had particles near the boundary that were not discs, uh, they were um, more rectangular, then those rectangular blocks would be forced to rotate into the melange and cause it to jam. I'm starting to get a little feedback here. Did anybody else notice that? Yeah, I am too. Yeah, I'm trying to see what the problem is. I, I'll turn to I turn my speaker down a little bit. Is that better? Yeah, it appears to be. We'll let you know if it comes back. And okay. make sure everybody else, make sure you're on mute, please. Just double check that you're all on mute. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, so, uh, so in this graph, in this uh, slide here, what you can see is just three snapshots from the movie, kind of three different regimes. One is while the while the melange is just starting to jam. Uh, the other one is, you know, it uh, it's jammed, but the motion is still fluctuating uh, quite heavily um, all the way into the bulk of the melange. And then the last picture there is kind of the steady state motion of the melange, where the particles near the boundary are undergoing the most motion, um, rotation that is, and the particles in the middle are kind of stuck. Um, and then what's most important maybe is we can calculate the total force on the terminus. Um, due to this melange, we just add up all the force from the particles that are touching the terminus. And it rises as the particles begin to jam, it rises up almost linearly. And then in the steady state, it reaches a kind of constant average value of 5 times 10 to the 7 newtons. Um, when scaled up to uh, a typical fjord dimensions where the, the width of the fjord is 5 kilometers. Um, but there's lots of fluctuations that you can see. And this data is averaged a little bit, too, so the fluctuations are even higher than what you see here. Um, and these are these kind of jamming and unjamming events um, that Michael was talking about. Um, so before I move on, I just kind of want to point out here that, uh, I mean, the material is jamming, but um, in the experiments when Michael did uh, used polydispersed disks, he really didn't see that much jamming at all. So um, I think the effects we're seeing here are actually rather small. If I had a fjord that wasn't perfectly straight, that was narrow in some region, or alternatively, if I had particles which weren't perfectly round, uh, I think that the force would probably be an order of magnitude or maybe, maybe a few orders of magnitude larger. So I'm not sure that this material 
is really becoming highly jammed at all. Um, uh, so this is just kind of our preliminary result so far. Uh, the most important effects have are in the process of being implemented into the model. <clears throat> okay, so um, one thing that uh, this is something that Jason and his um, uh, co-authors addressed in a paper back in 2010, right? So it, could it be possible some of the largest calving events, these cubic kilometer calving events that we see in Greenland, these ones that cause earthquakes and and uh, and other effects. Um, are due to rotation of very large icebergs. So the iceberg tips over and capsizes um, and releases a huge amount of gravitational potential energy in the process. Um, and this is becoming kind of more common in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. We're seeing a lot more of these. Um, but the question is, is that if you had a melange in front, uh, could that prevent rotation of the iceberg and thus affect calving? Um, uh, and so if you look at that diagram there, you see that the rotation point is on the upper right-hand side where the corner touches the terminus, but the melange is pushing a little bit lower than that. So it actually is applying a torque that wants to push the iceberg back towards the terminus. So a large enough force from the melange could hold the iceberg in place. And so uh, Jason and his co-authors analyzed the, the geometry of this uh, scenario and the plot on the bottom shows um, what kind of force melange would have to apply per unit length in the in the out of plane direction in the lateral direction along the terminus force per unit meter how much force per what is the force per unit meter that would be required to prevent the iceberg from rotating if it was already rotated by one degree two degrees three degrees four degrees and five degrees and so what we can see here is that basically um, it depends on the aspect ratio of the iceberg, but roughly if the iceberg's rotated by one degree, it's going to take about two times 10 to the seven new, uh, newtons per meter in order to keep it held back. And the reason that we think that this is important, is maybe if you remember one of the earlier videos that Jason showed, um, we certainly see ice melange motion correlates with calving. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but I'm not sure if we know that uh, the ice melange moves and then the calving event starts or the calving event starts and then the ice melange moves. It's kind of a chicken and the egg type of scenario there, but it's, uh, it's definitely possible that the ice melange is holding the iceberg, ba the iceberg back. Um, some, the ice melange unjams for whatever reason, and then suddenly the iceberg is able to rotate and calve off of the glacier face. So that's kind of the thing, that's kind of what we're thinking about right now. Uh, so next steps for modeling. Um, so uh, the total force per unit uh, terminus length from the model that I showed you with that graph of the force with all the fluctuations is about 1.2 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. Uh, from Jason's graph that I just showed you from his paper in 2010, we would need 2 times 10 to the 7 newtons per meter to require uh, to stop iceberg rotation. So as I mentioned, um, I, we really suspect that the narrowing of the channel walls and non-circular particle shape will greatly increase the uh, jamming behavior by orders of magnitude, um, given the given what the experiments say. So this this is something that I'm going to try to address immediately in the simulations. Um, channel walls can be varied. Uh, ch channel walls of varying geometry can be added by just using fixed disks along the boundary. We can build little mountains out of disks along the the boundary of the fjord and make any kind of fjord geometry you want. Um, it could even look, you know, strikingly similar to uh, a realistic fjord if we if we had, you know, some aerial maps to go on. Uh, particle shape plays a very important role for jamming in open channels. Uh, the easiest thing we can do to test this is by gluing two spheres together to make non-circular icebergs. Um, and then adhesive forces, if we if, if we want to start thinking about sea ice. Um, and seasonality and how that can affect um, calving, we can add uh, uh, adhesive forces between our icebergs that represent kind of a gluing from sea ice. And then if, there, if there's enough force on them, then that sea ice can break um, and the whole thing can unjam. So we can add that in there too in a kind of a, in a, simple, in a simple way. Um, I think that's all I had and that's the end of our presentation. So, um, uh, I think at this point, maybe we'll just ha answer any questions anybody has, and we're, we're welcome to have any feedback you have.
Okay, thank you very much, guys. That was that was really enlightening. Uh, very exciting work. So, are there any questions from the people on the phone? Can you guys hear me? This is Ellen Enderlin. Yeah. Um, I actually had a question thinking about the the shapes that you're using, and your one of your big assumptions is that you're saying that the the icebergs are essentially two dimensional. Um, do you think it would make a big difference if you started to include the, the sort of depth aspect of it? Because there are not only going to be smaller icebergs in the, the horizontal plane, but also in the vertical, and that might affect how they raft and shear past each other. Uh, I can address that in the modeling. Uh, um, I think that might be important, but you can estimate the type of stress that would be necessary to kind of move an iceberg up and down. Uh, just based on buoyancy forces. And I think there only becomes important at the largest, like when it's really heavily jammed, I think it could be uh, quite important actually. Um, but most of the time, I don't think it's, it's, um, it's quite as uh, big of a deal because uh, an iceberg feels an individual stress, but the terminus itself feels um, stress from all the icebergs. So you can, you can have a smaller stress on any individual iceberg, but a, a, an actual rather large stress on the terminus. Um, but, you know, there's nothing that's stopping the model from making these spheres floating in water, feeling hydrostatic forces, and if if they want to move up and down, then they're welcome to move up and down. Um, and that's something that's kind of, you know, down the line, maybe a, a year or two into the, into the modeling effort, that's something that we wanted to implement. Okay, and sort of as a, a follow-up, what kind of um, of iceberg size distribution are you using? Um, I think Michael was going to have a comment on your previous question, but okay. I'll just answer that comment really quickly. Uh, I just choose um, a Gaussian distribution with a mean and a standard deviation for iceberg sizes, and I can control those okay. parameters. Um, that's just what I'm using right now, though. And this is Michael. I'll answer both at the same time from the experiment. The nice thing for the first question from the experiment is the way we're designing the trough. We can monitor the vertical motion. We'll monitor the vertical motion of any particles as well as the horizontal. So we will be looking for, at least in the experiments in the lab, how much are they really moving up and down and how much does it really seem to play a role. Um, you know, we've done, not in this particular geometry, but we've done a lot of work with stuff floating on the surface of water, and it does always seem to be dominated by in-plane interactions, but that doesn't okay. preclude the vertical becoming important. Um, and right now, you know, we, we are, you know, started the experiments not knowing what would happen with very simple, as you can see, just either one size of disk or two sizes of disk. But we have two things that we're going to do. We, we have a wide range of particle sizes that we can kind of map to the data that Jason gets. We're even going to try and be a little insane from the physics side. You know, the whole point is to try and use simple particles and see what we can get mm -hmm. out. But we, we, we do have um, a 3D printer that it, it might, it should allow us to generate interesting set of um, many little plastic icebergs that match, say, some data um, Jason gives us that we use and digitize and put into the 3D printer, which okay. will be kind of a fun thing to do, to compare yeah. to. Expensive, but fun. Yeah. It, it would be a question once and for all whether or not, you know, our simple model of rectangles or disks or whatever we're using actually kind of is applicable to irregularly shaped particles, possibly convex particles. Yeah, and I guess I just add to this that the uh, you know, we're starting we're starting with the simplest situations that are easy to analyze. But sort of my role in the project is to to try and get these guys to to do things as close to reality as we can. And so I'll be providing them with um, you know some some basic field data that they can compare to their experiments and um, such as velocity fields and. Uh, iceberg size distributions and things like that. Okay, so things that will give them headaches, basically. Exactly. <laughs> I, and I think to add to that, the really cool thing about this project is, one, we have the ability, I think, by collaborating with Jason to get almost as complex as we want, which isn't necessarily what you always want to do in a simple physics experiment, but it's still 
a nice knob to have. Um, and, it just, and so that lets us know how much energy or effort we need to expand, expend to really get a good model of what's going on in the fjord. But already, even without that, it turns out that the simplest system, as I mentioned in the experiments, showed jamming that really hadn't been seen before in granular materials because it hadn't been looked at from this geometry and this perspective. Uh -huh. So we have a great backup plan, which is even if this doesn't apply to the fjord, the granular problem is fascinating. <laughs> but, okay, thank you guys. Other questions? Hearing none, thank you again, Michael, Justin, Jason. That was really an exciting presentation.